Hello everybody! Today's topic is the RAF, the Royal Air Force. Finally something that won't be demonetized. Wait, what? You're saying it's not the Royal Air Force, but rather the uh, West German underground terrorist organization responsible for a series of bombings, kidnappings and murders over 30 years called the Red Army Faction? Well, that doesn't sound advertiser friendly at all! Oh well, I have Patreon, so here we go. The Red Army Faction was a self-proclaimed underground city guerrilla organization. They were active between 1970 and somewhere around the early 90s. Their main operations were uh, bombing NATO-related targets, robbing banks and killing and or kidnapping capitalists. They would send a lot of letters and manifestos explaining themselves and their choice of targets, with this logo at the bottom every time. They were, of course, all far-left activists who took issue with the West German government, as well as the ones of all non-socialist nations. Their original German name is Rote Armee Fraktion, which translates to Red Army Fraction, but in English Fraction implies a smaller part of a whole, while in German it's more like a splinter group. The RAF called itself an offshoot of the Red Army, not a part of it. Whether the RAF was terrorists or not can be hotly debated. In the end, the difference between terrorism and rebellion is whether you succeed. And because they failed and are commonly called terrorists, I will call them that as well. If you disagree with this, please comment. It boosts engagement. But please watch the section about what they did before telling me they weren't terrorists, because it has some relevant information. From this point on, to avoid confusion, I will call it RAF instead of RAF, which may or may not make this video easier to follow. I'm not really sure to be honest, but at least you won't confuse the RAF with the RAF now. I think to give this video some structure, I should go over the basic timeline for a second. The RAF was active for around 20 to 30 years, so it can get pretty confusing at times. The action first considered to be done by the RAF was getting a fellow socialist freed from prison. The future RAF members shot and killed some police officers in order to get him out. These people would form the first wave of the RAF. They then started robbing banks, bombing police stations and NATO installations and in 1975 they were all captured and put on trial. This is the end of the first wave. The second wave is made up of the members of the first wave that got away in time. Naturally, their main goal was to get their comrades out of prison. And holy hell, they did some wacky shit, which I don't want to spoil here. Their actions eventually fizzled out, which may or may not have caused the third wave to start in the late 80s and early 90s, but that is really disputed, which I will of course get into in due time. This video will go over why the RAF existed, who the members were, what they thought, what they did, how they lost, how they almost came back and how it all ended. Nowadays the RAF is completely defunct. There haven't been any messages from them since the early 90s, which is 30 years ago. It still lives on in pop culture, especially in Germany, and of course as a militant group of wannabe socialist revolutionaries, it is very interesting for a socialist big government anarchist like myself. It also showed that even a western liberal capitalist state can turn really authoritarian really quickly under the pretense of preventing terrorism. But there's a whole section of that. Naturally, there are a lot of movies and documentaries on the RAF. The chief among them is the Bader Meinhof Complex, which is a movie that goes over all the major parts of the RAF story. If I had to review it, I would say it's a good movie if you already know the RAF. Even though it's a two and a half hour movie, it doesn't go into their motivations at all and only barely explains why the things that happen, happen. It also has way too many named characters, because it is based on real people. So it's overwhelming and confusing to watch. There is a reason I will name barely any of the RAF members in this video. There is also a British documentary from 1977, so at the height of the RAF, uh, by the Thames TV, which is mostly about how the German state is reacting to the terror threat. And it's got major 
the Germans are going fascist again vibes. And it really shows just how fucked up the German state reacted. There are way more documentaries in all languages, on all facets of the RAF, but the movie and the Thames TV documentary are, in my opinion, the most watchable ones. The movie is on Netflix, and after you watch this video, I can recommend it. All that finally being said, let's get into the mindset of the early 70s. It was only 25 years since the Third Reich ended, so there were a lot of former Nazis just running around, holding high political offices and such. And around the 70s, the baby boomers came of age. And they weren't really happy with the fact that all these Nazis are pretending they didn't know about the crimes of fascism. Of course, after the war, Nazi Germany was split six ways. With the intention of preventing Germany, which was the greatest superpower in the world up to this point, from starting another world war. Regions were given to Russia and Poland. Uh, then they established a communist East Germany, a capitalist West Germany, a capitalist silent protectorate that would eventually join the West, and the one everybody forgets about, Austria, the third German state, which wrote into its constitution that it must remain neutral, like an off-brand Switzerland. After the war, there was a baby boom. The children were called boomers, and they grew up in the 70s. And just like the Americans did in the 70s, they were really angry about a lot of things their parents had done. Like, for example, in the US, they protested the Vietnam War and institutional racism. And they took an incredible amount of drugs. We don't often hear about it, but the same thing was going on in the entire West. Counterculture movements manifested everywhere. In the late 60s, there was a student protest movement in West Germany that protested racism, anti-feminism, and sometimes even capitalism and American imperialism in Vietnam and NATO itself. Marxism, socialism, and anarchism were part of the counterculture, along with drugs. Lots of drugs. The state responded to these protests by banning anyone who was a radical from public sector jobs. They also had the police beat the shit out of the peaceful protesters more than once. The media was at every step acting against the protests. So did all political parties, since both of them were controlled by older people, who were not part of the counterculture. So these students felt like they had no way to actually make their beliefs heard. Then the Shah of Iran visited Berlin, and his supporters turned up armed with staffs to attack the peaceful protesters. The police responded with beating the protesters as well. And they even shot an unarmed man. Naturally, this did not calm down the protesters. And then a neo-Nazi shot the student protest leader in the head. Twice! He survived, but severely disabled, barely able to speak. In steps Ulrike Meinhof. She was young, she was a journalist, she was a communist, she was frustrated with nothing getting done. She worked with a lot of her friends and comrades to organize protests and such. They noticed that the state was unwilling to engage with the subjects of the protests, so they would take stronger measures. Let's have a look at what their ideas were before we get into all the terrorism they did. The group had no central ideology. It was made up of many different cells or commandos, which operated independently of each other and often only barely knew each other. They often got orders from people whose position they weren't aware of and whose real name they never heard. On trial, the founding members even distanced themselves from some of the actions of other commandos. You may think that they had this decentral leadership style because they were anarchists or something like that, and they had many members with libertarian, socialist and anarchist ideas, but the leaders were self-proclaimed Marxist-Leninists, meaning they believed in a revolutionary class seizing the state. The decentralized structure was more of a practical thing to protect members than an ideological one. This, of course, worked, because when the first wave was captured, the second wave was still able to continue operations and attempt to liberate the first one. Hearing that their leaders were Marxist-Leninists, you may think that they would be best friends with the USSR and the Eastern Bloc. They were not. Like many leftists post-Brezhnev, they considered the USSR an imperialist power that didn't respect the will of the people, 
no better than the USA itself. Of course, when East Germany gave them funding, weapons, training, and eventually amnesty, they still accepted it. So they liked the Leninist style of revolution, but didn't like the USSR and the Eastern Bloc, while also being aggressively anti-imperialist. Sound familiar? That's Maoism. They, they were Maoists. Not all of them, again, they were a diverse bunch. They had plenty of new left anarchist and even non-communist members. As I mentioned, the commanders were very different. Handily, in 1971, they released a 14-page manifesto explaining their views and justifications of their actions. And here I go again, reading a terrorist's manifesto and summing it up. Yay for being on another watch list. I will leave a link in the description, but it's in German. So if you really want to read it, you may have to Google up a translation. Alternatively, keep watching. I'm going to tell you the interesting parts. They start off by quoting Mao. They will do this on every second page. They say that it's good that the state hates them because it means they properly created a line between themselves and the enemy, which I guess makes sense. Uh, the first section is about answering questions that people have about the RAF. They immediately dispel some myths the news had written about them for sensationalism. For example, that they do not intend on hurting normal people, that they only kidnap people who they think deserve it, that they don't have officers and soldiers, and that they're all equally in charge, that they do not liquidate people, and that no, they don't hunt down ex-members for disengaging with groups. They then cite an at-the-time revolutionary book titled The Authoritarian Personality, which basically explains what type of person is likely to comply with the fascist state. And they use this to accuse those who are their enemies of being potential fascist sympathizers. They also mention how their personalities are free, since they're communist resistance and not fascist collaborators. They mention how the entire state was doing everything to repress not only the RAF, but all leftists, Marxists and so on. This is partially true, as we will see later, and partially an attempt to convince leftists to support the RAF by saying that they will be the next ones once the government cracks down. They also say that the capitalist West German government was naive to assume they had socialism under control while running a capitalist state. They then assert that because of all this repression by the state, it's impossible for them to make a political difference without military action. They proclaim that it's time for guerrilla fighters in the cities to fulfill the highest form of Marxism-Leninism by rising up. They say there is no fighting imperialism without arms. They then clarify that illegal uprisings do not replace legal workers' organizations, like unions, but that both are necessary for success against the capitalist state. They also clarify that they are not anarchists, presumably to calm down the average German, because many of them were in fact anarchists, but who's keeping track? Section 2 is titled The Metropolis of the Federal Republic. They sum up some of the things that caused frustration among their generation, as well as the fact that most of this frustration wasn't directed at anything in specific, and that many protesters were angry without knowing what they're angry at. They also pronounced that they are the continuation of anti-fascists and communists from the past and not part of the new left, as some media said, a mistake which I made a good 10 minutes ago as well. They criticized the West German government for fueling imperialist wars of the US by selling weapons and providing financial support, as well as being a member of NATO, which they saw as a union for capitalist aggression. They point out that conveniently, Germany is profiting from the war in Vietnam without being held politically responsible, because they aren't technically actively at war, so most people don't even protest. This is still true. Germany doesn't take part in wars like in northern Syria, but they will sell tanks to rebels fighting there, which means they profit of foreign wars without being held accountable by the population. Great. The RAF also say that they don't see the situation in West Germany optimistically, which I consider an under-exaggeration. Like, I don't see YouTube's demonetization policy optimistically, but I've not bombed anyone over it. Part 3 of the manifesto is called Student Rebellion, 
Unsurprisingly, it's about the violently oppressed Syrian uprisings that formed the start of the RAF. They say that the media that compare protesting students to armed South American rebellions were just trying to scare people for attention. They are perfectly aware that students criticizing capitalism and armies fighting for liberation are completely separate degrees of determination. However, they also explain that the German government is reacting to these tame students like they would against the Marxist-Leninist army invading. Many comparisons between West Germany and Nazi Germany are made. They also explain that they in West Germany are fighting the same enemy as the Viet Cong fight in their land. They declare solidarity with all anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist fighters around the world. They then say that the socialist members of the student rebellion had some good ideas, like spreading propaganda to workers, demoralizing American soldiers by reminding them that the war is pointless, uh, democratizing the police and faking papers for sympathizers and encouraging workers to sabotage the production of napalm, among other things. The RAF also says that these students are too pacifist because they oppose bombings, kidnappings and assassinations. They also point out that the student movement fell apart when the government opened up slightly and allowed some reforms. The fourth section is called Primat der Praxis, which roughly means prime person of the praxis. They explain that they think it's not possible for socialist intellectuals and the proletariat to form a single political union in West Germany of the late 70s, in the same way it was done by Lenin and Mao. They then criticize contemporary leftist organizations for focusing too much on theory and properly citing other Marxists than about practically organizing for a revolution. Then they point out that Mao, in his 1926 analysis of the classes in China, didn't just divide classes by economic position, but also based on which side of the class conflict they fought on. The RAF says that they will use the same analysis. They consider all factions that take practical action against capitalism, like themselves, to be on the side of the workers and everyone else to be an enemy of the people. They declare that the socialist parties in parliament are ultimately doomed because they try to follow the rules the state makes and the state has made a lot of laws against socialism. So it's realistic to believe that they will eventually ban the socialist parties once they become a threat. The next section is called City Guerrillas and it explains that capitalism is a force that is fighting its battles all around the globe, even where there is no open war. And they state that it should be fought everywhere, including where there is no open war yet, like picking completely at random West Germany. To them, they were in a state of war already. They clarify that fighting for the sake of fighting is a bad idea, and they should only engage in fights they can win. They model their idea after Latin American and Vietnamese guerrilla fighters, who likewise only fought battles they could win. They also state that actions speak louder than words, and that city guerrillas are an essential part of future revolutionary movements. They then have a few paragraphs about what city guerrillas should be like. For example, they should target state organizations to make the state seem less invincible. They should also take part in legal political work. They should not trust mainstream news and they should cut off all options of retreating into the civilian economy again. Which sounds like a cult, but okay. The final section is called legality and illegality. They explain that since the state is the one who decides what is legal and what isn't, it will always declare rebellion illegal and its own actions legal, no matter what the previous law said. They say legality is just a question of who is in power so they have no reason to follow the law, since they oppose the state which made the laws. Then they explain that reformism will always fail because the state can just outlaw reformist parties and only people that don't understand that are naive enough to support reformism. But they are willing to admit that the state is currently 
still liberal enough to allow these communist parties to exist in its parliament because it knows that they're no threat. They say that the state deliberately tries to seem as if it can reform to appeal to, for example, the student protests of the late 60s. This way it prevents people from taking radical action. They also explain how social democrats aren't socialists, which, if you are a regular viewer, is obvious as hell, but apparently this was news to the average West German in 1971. Then they say that they may well share the fate of the Black Panthers, meaning being vilified by the press and killed by the police, but they are willing to make the sacrifice. They say that they are the connection between illegal revolution and legal revolutionary work, and that despite the weak state of revolutionary groups, we must take action now. It ends with this quote, translated by me, so you know. Either you're part of the problem or part of the solution. There is no in-between. The third has been analyzed and theorized about for decades and generations, observed from all sides. I just think that the most of what happens in this country doesn't have to be analyzed anymore. I don't think I need to explain what that metaphor stands for. Now that we heard about their theory, let's look at what praxis they did. The first action that is attributed to the RAF is the so-called Baderbefreiung, which translates to Bader liberation, and took place in 1970. What happened was that the popular socialist named Bader was arrested for uh, setting fire to things in protest. So a friend named Ulrike Meinhof, who was a journalist, hatched a plan to get him out. They organized an interview of Bader in Meinhof's house. He was still in prison, so he would be accompanied by armed guards. They had Meinhof's friends storm the building to fight off the guards, and then they would run away. It worked, and they only killed about three people. The identity of Meinhof's friends was not known, so the only people the police were sure were involved were Bader and Meinhof, which is why the group was called the Bader-Meinhof group, at least until they gave themselves the name Red Army Faction. Seeing that they were now publicly known criminals, they decided to double down and get serious. This is when they wrote the manifesto. Uh, they contacted some sympathetic leftists in Jordan and somehow got there without being caught. I must assume in the 70s airport security didn't exist. And they were trained by guerrilla fighters that wanted to uh, liberate Palestine. When they returned to West Germany, they started doing things resistant fighters do, like for example, uh, engaging in a shootout with police to prevent one of their friends from being arrested. They also robbed a lot of banks, so they had lots of money. And after every attack, they wrote a letter explaining why they chose this target, what their justification was, as well as what their intention was. As enemies of Western capitalist imperialism, the RAF naturally hated NATO and the American soldiers stationed in Germany. So they did the obvious thing and planted a bomb inside of a US Army headquarters, killing one and injuring 14. Remember when I said that it can be debated whether they were terrorists or not? See, this may seem like they definitely were, but you see, they said they were at war with NATO, so according to them, the bombing was justified, because in war, bombings happen. I don't know if I'm convinced by that, but it was their explanation. Besides NATO, they also dislike the West German capitalist state. So they bombed the police station, luckily killing nobody. And they planted a bomb in the car of a federal judge, which didn't even hit him, but rather his wife, who luckily survived the injuries. The next one is the greatest botched operation in the entire RAF history. The Axel Springer publishing house had before written bad things about them, so they did what any sane person does with criticism and planted a bomb in the building, like good guys do. They of course knew it was filled with employees, and see above, they are communists, so they don't want to hurt workers. To make sure of that, after planting the bomb, they called the publishing house and told them to evacuate, which they didn't do. So 17 people were wounded by this action. In the letter, the RAF said that they were sorry, uh, that workers were affected. 
but it's the fault of the capitalists for valuing production so high that you won't evacuate for a potential false alarm. After this, they did what they liked to do best and bombed the NATO installation. After all this going on, the German state was trying everything to catch these people, specifically the ones at the top of the leadership structure. This is where that British documentary is set, and holy hell the Wikipedia page does not nearly convey how fucked up that was. The German state started off by firing everybody slightly leftist. If you were a professor who talked about Marxism uh, ever, you were now unemployed uh, forever. Over 400 pacifist intellectuals lost their livelihoods because the German state couldn't tell the difference between them and the RAF. They were literally called enemies of the state. One was fired just for saying that the RAF letter should be published. Freedom of information means communist infiltrator. C clearly. When firing unrelated intellectuals didn't work, the state decided to just count every citizen as a potential suspect. They established random checkpoints everywhere. Every entry and exit of city, every autobahn, all state borders, all federal borders. Like you couldn't drive anywhere without being a terror suspect. Sort of like how airports work nowadays. Naturally, the rebelling students were not happy about this. And the RAF itself took all of this as a sign that the capital state was indeed not far away from turning into a fascist one again. So they acted like they were resistance fighters against Nazi Germany. West Germany, of course, knew that what it was doing wasn't very individual liberty. But they decided to double down by writing a new emergency constitution, which gave the ruling party authoritarian power and which made exemptions to all human rights protections the Allies wrote into the German constitution after the war. Most notably, they made a law that allowed them to inter terror suspects indefinitely without any human contact, including with lawyers, without a trial. See, before researching this, I thought West Germany was better than the East, and sort of like modern Germany with freedom and such, but it was straight up like the US during the Red Scare, an authoritarian state more concerned with not being communist than with liberty. Of course, most Germans were completely fine with the state turning authoritarian. Everyone above 30 remembered the Nazi times, most notably a former SS member and 30-year-long governor of Bavaria legitimately said that he isn't against individual liberty, he just thinks that the state looking strong is more important than following the constitution. He also said that lawyers who protect terror suspects are criminals themselves, which means he wanted to prevent them from getting a fair trial. No red flags here, just a major member of the government overtly wishing they had no civil rights under the guise of stopping terrorism. Eventually all these measures to catch the founding graph members were completely pointless. The way they caught them was using the fancy new technology called computers. By searching the database for people who paid all of their bills in cash. During the trial they were kept in the Stanheim prison. To be more specific they were kept in solitary confinement in a block of Stanheim prison that was specifically built to hold RAF suspects. It was supposed to be the most secure prison block in all of Germany. During their time there, they managed to communicate using handwritten notes passed along by their lawyer, who they of course had frequent contact with, because they were in the middle of their trial. They managed to organize multiple hunger strikes, and one of the four actually starved himself during that. The trial was a shit show. One of the judges had before tried the head of the Nazi court system and found him innocent. Seven times. Another one was a Nazi party member who threatened the suspects with physical abuse. The microphones of the suspects were often cut off mid-sentence. They were expelled from the court for saying things the judge didn't like many times. The lawyer pointed out that these prisoners had been in solitary confinement for three years now and that their mental state was not ready for a trial this long, the judges didn't care. Then, in the middle of the trial, the German parliament 
made it legal to expel the defense lawyer from the trial, leaving the excuse to fend for themselves for the first time since the end of Nazi Germany. The lawyer was later arrested for supposedly supporting terrorists by being their lawyer. The defense strategy of the RAF members uh, was basically to point out that, compared to the crimes of the state and NATO, they're the smaller evil. Of course, they had no chance to convince the judges of that, but their goal was more to convince the media that was present, sort of like the OJ trial, but worse. Of course, they were eventually all judged guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Germany is a civilized country, so it has no death penalty. As I told you before, the RAF was organized very decentrally, so the German state couldn't arrest all RAF members like they did with the founders. Some of them weren't caught, and they adjusted their strategy to focus on getting the founding members out. These people would be known as the second wave of the RAF. To force the West German state to release the first wave, a commando decided to get machine pistols, travel to Stockholm, and lay siege to the West German embassy. They brought TNT, took 13 hostages, and barricaded themselves in the upper floor. When the Swedish special forces showed up, they told them to get lost or they would shoot hostages. The forces ignored them, so they marched a German military attaché to the stairs and shot him. While the police was preparing to storm the place, there were a series of explosions. It turns out one of the members of the commando dropped a grenade that set off their TNT store. Our surviving ones of the RAF members were arrested and sent to Germany, sharing the same prison as the first wave members. Then another commando decided that they would take a hostage to demand the release of the RAF members in return. They decided on Jürgen Ponto, the head of a major bank in Germany, and thus a capitalist. They completely botched it and killed him instead of taking him hostage. Dedicated not to give up so easily, they decided on a new target to kidnap, Hans Schleier, the leader of the German Employers Association and one of the most powerful industrialists in the entire country. The issue was he had a police escort, since, as we already established, Germany was going full fast mode. They got around that by backing their car up into his and shooting for people. But not the hostage this time. They again demanded the release of the RAF prisoners. After waiting for a month, it became clear that the state did not intend to take part in that hostage exchange. So they did what good guys do, and they hijacked an airliner filled with innocent civilians. Airport security apparently still failed to exist. They were helped by the Palestinian fighters that had originally trained the first wave of the RAF. They decided to target a Lufthansa plane with 91 civilians inside, which was flanked from Mallorca to Frankfurt. They diverted the flight through many destinations, keeping the hostages for a total of four days, still demanding the West German government release the RAF prisoners, or else they would kill all the hostages. Totally not terrorists, though. Because the high security wing the prisoners were in was a joke, all of the RAF prisoners had radios or TVs, so they followed the story live, and they were convinced that they would be let out soon. After all, Saving 91 civilians is more important than keeping four prisoners, right? So they assumed, when offered that choice, the state would accept the exchange. The state was not interested in engaging with this, so they sent special forces to storm the plane. Long story short, all the RAF members died and all passengers were fine. This pretty much shattered the hope of the first wave members to ever be released. The second wave ended with this action depending on who you ask. And at the same day, they heard the news, all remaining four RAF prisoners in the high security wing committed suicide. One hang herself, one cut her veins, and two shot themselves. Yes, you heard that correctly. They shot themselves. They had access to revolvers in the most secure prison in all of West Germany. Supposedly, their lawyer somehow smuggled them in, but this doesn't reflect well on the prison. Out of the five people in the high security tract, five committed suicide. After hearing about this in the news, most of the remaining RAF members left the movement, some moving to East Germany, which gave them amnesty and kept them under 24-7 surveillance. But they still had that hostage who was now worthless. They decided they can't just execute him, no, 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 no. So they would just make up 
a revolutionary tribunal made up of themselves to decide what to do. Uh, they decided to execute him. Of course, some of the RAF members thought their comrades were executed and didn't commit suicide. Uh, the second wave partially kept going on, attempting and failing to assassinate NATO commanders and officers, uh, bombing NATO buildings, once attacking an American nuclear storage site with a sniper rifle, as well as robbing banks and so on. Around the mid-80s, there was a gap in RAF action, which is sometimes called the end of the second wave. In the late 80s, as two of the German nations were coming closer together and global socialism was falling apart, the RAF attacks picked up again, ultimately ending in the early 90s. There are arguments about whether there really was such a thing as the third wave, because nobody from that wave has ever been identified. And all old members of the RAF say that they didn't know anyone responsible, and it may just have been people trying to steal their valor by copying the RAF. Most confusingly, a letter saying that the RAF was dissolved was sent to the news in 1989, but there were still three more attacks which were attributed to the RAF. Among them, the killing of Detlef Rohwerder, which very likely was done by the Stasi instead, who just tried to pin it on the RAF. The whole thing is so complicated that they made a full documentary just about that one murder on Netflix. Since then, there have been many people who were fascinated by the RAF, especially among German anarchist cycles. The RAF may not have been anarchist, but they fought all the things anarchists would fight, like the police, the state, NATO, and so on. In conclusion, the RAF was active from 1970 to somewhere in the late 80s or early 90s, depending on who you listen to. They are responsible for a total of 34 deaths of capitalists, police and bodyguards, while losing 27 of their members in the same time period. They definitely show that liberal capital states can turn frighteningly authoritarian once a small terror threat shows up, a pattern that has been obvious ever since then. They completely terrified a whole generation of politicians and inspired a new generation of socialists. Their actions undoubtedly fall under the definition of terrorism, and I have to say I don't see how bombing an NATO building would have any real-world effect. But then again, according to them, I'm a counter-revolutionary because I talk to people about socialism instead of um, hijacking airliners. Unfortunately, the theory the RAF released was basically just copy-pasted from South American fighters and Mao. So even the Unabomber had a larger influence on leftist ideologies, because at least he had new ideas. So should we celebrate the RAF as heroes of leftism or write them off as idealistic terrorists? Well, I mean, you decide. I'm not gonna tell you everything. But what I can tell you is that this video is demonetized. I wonder why. Please donate on Patreon. And while you're at it, subscribe. I want to reach 50k by the end of the year, so share this with everyone. And if you donate, you get to join my Discord server and play Minecraft with me. And if that's not an incentive, I don't know what is. Special thanks to Darius the Bird, Eric Betts, Harris Hawks, Hugo Castellos, Carissa, Daniel Hyman, Emily Marigold Klassen, Gabi Gita, Hurlington Gordington, Josh C, Klaustro, Lilith Kraft, Marxism Tonight, Nane Pema, Nora Quinn, Pote, Raymond Deville, Red Shock Trooper, Sean Murphy, Silva, Skylar Magnum Turner, Steermaster Chef and Trey.